Welcome to Imagine Made Simple, the detail editor. For the next couple of hours, we will be discussing the detail editor. This is the editor you create objects and define surfaces. We will not be showing you spectacular images or animations, but we'll focus on helping you, the user, create your own. Let's get started. The first screen you're presented with is the project screen. From here, we can go to one of the drop menus under editor and select detail editor. Imagine uses what is called the tri view to display all the objects. You can display the top part of the object, the front, the right, and the fourth display will be the perspective view. You can go to any one of these displays to see a full screen view of it, such as clicking on the bar with the left mouse button. You have a top view. You can then go to the right view, to the front, and also to the perspective view. Clicking back to the left on the present screen that you're located in brings you back to your tri view. Imagine users drop menus at the top that you can activate by clicking the right mouse button. You have a project menu, display, object, mode, functions, pick select. You also have user defined gadgets at the bottom of your screen. To demonstrate some of the features that you have within the detail editor, you can go to your primitive gadget at the bottom and you can select from a variety of six primitives. You have a sphere, tube, cone, torus, disc, and plane. We will select cone. We will accept the default parameters. And we have a cone. Before you can manipulate the objects within a detail editor, you will need to first pick the object. Two ways you can do this. One would be to use the mouse button to click on the axis or you could use F1 of your function keys from your keyboard. Once the object has been selected, you'll see that it will turn a purplish blue color, letting you know that this object is now in pick select mode. From here, you can do a number of things with the object, such as you can rotate the object either on its X, Y, or Z axis, At the same time, seeing each screen update in a wireframe mode to give you an idea of what the object will look like from the top view, from the front, and from the right. After you have the object in the place that you're wanting to put it in, simply hit the space bar, or you can click OK. You will then see your 3D perspective view update to the changes you have just made to your object. You can also move this object by using the move feature. You can move the object just on its X or just the Y or the Z. If you're not certain as to the particular movement, you can look at the bottom of your screens and you will see you have a guide to go by. On the top view, Y would be in and out. X would be left to right. On the front view, X, Z would be up and down. X would be left and right. On the right view, Z is up and down. While on the Y axis, it would be in and out. To scale an object, simply click on scale. All axes are depressed on your gadget buttons. Hold down your left mouse button and scale the object larger, or you can scale the object smaller. You can simply scale an object by using just the X or just Y and, of course, on the Z. These are your basic manipulation of your objects, and for the most part, you'll be using these tools quite frequently. Once we've had a chance to move, rotate, and scale our object, we can get a much better feel of how the objects work in our 3D views. The other thing that you can do with your objects 
is that you can also move the object on its axis. Bringing up a simple plane. Pick the object, we scale it a little bit larger. And if we wanted to make a door, we could use, hold down the shift key, hit M and L on your keyboard for move, and let's use shift X to move this axis just on the X axis, and move it to the edge of the object. Use spacebar to accept the change. Now let's go ahead and rotate the object by using R on the keyboard. We'll rotate locally on its local axis. And as we do so, we see we actually have a swinging door by moving the axis. For the first exercise, we will create a picture frame and we will put a brush map of a picture inside this frame. The way we want to start this out would be to, instead of using a primitive function, we will go ahead and use F4 to add an axis. Also, under Functions menu, under the Add menu, you will see you can add primitives here, or you can add the axis here, as well as at the bottom. We will go ahead and add an axis. As you can see, it is orange when it first appears on the screen. We will need to select this axis. Do so by hitting F1. We want to go to the front view. And we want to go ahead and start creating our picture frame. First thing we want to do is go into our mode menu and add lines. We will start by clicking with our left mouse button on one of the intersecting points. We will come down. As we click again, we have added a line. As we go to the right, we've added the second line, the third, and then back onto the last point to create the box. Some of our lines were a little bit crooked. What we want to do right now is go into pick points under the mode menu. Our pick method decides how we want to pick these points. Click means with the mouse. You can click one at a time, the left mouse button to click one point at a time. You can use drag box to Take a box and surround as many points as you need to, so you can select more than one point. Lasso is a little bit different. You actually draw a circle and the shape of any shape that you move your mouse in to select points. Uh, for this one, we will use drag box. Hold down your shift key so we can select more than one point. As you see, when you hold down the shift key, you will go into multi-pick mode. In this mode, you'll be able to pick as many points as you need to. Simply take your lasso, make sure that you're covering all the points you want to select. Release the mouse button, and you see your points have changed color to a red. This, ind this indicates that you have selected the points. Go back into your functions menu, and you'll see snap to grid. When you use this feature, you will snap all the points close to the nearest closest intersecting grid on your front of your object. This will put all your lines and straighten all your lines up, giving you a perfect box. The other method we could have used was simply go into the functions under the mode menu, and we could have select drag points, where we could have dra drug each point individually until we had each line as straight as we needed to have it. The next thing we want to do is use your right Omega 1 which will put us in pick groups mode. You'll see this at the top of your screen, the mode that you're located in at this time. Let's go ahead and copy this by using right Omega C to copy. We will then use the right Omega P to paste, and we'll use F1 to select the newly pasted object. We can scale this down a little bit. We'll use right Omega R to redraw the screen. And as we've seen, we now see two objects. We need to move our other object a little bit more in the center. We'll use space bar to accept the change. Now, one thing we want to do is we want to add faces. 
to the outside of our, of our picture frame. There's two ways we can do this. One, we could use a slice feature, or we could extrude this object out, lower the plane, and put the plane inside the box, and use slice, and slice will add faces to our objects. We could also manually add faces to this object by going one point at a time. Another feature that you can use to add faces is called skin. And we will do that. We will choose that method at this time. Use your right Amiga A to select both objects. Go into your object drop menu and go down to skin. Release your mouse button. And as you see, your object has been, the faces have been put down for you. If we go to our perspective mode, and view this object, we can view this in two different ways. The first way is a wireframe mode. Second way would be a solid mode. The third would be a, a shaded mode. Under shaded mode, when you're adding faces, this is the mode that I, I generally select. It enables you to see the faces much more clearly. You cannot see these faces in a wireframe mode, and they're a little bit difficult to tell sometimes, even in solid mode. But in shading mode, as you can see, they're quite detailed. We can then take our slider. We can rotate this object and move this object around in our perspective view. Get a look at all sides of our object. Now that we have the faces on the outside of our picture frame, the next step we want to do is we want to go ahead and put faces to the center of our frame. We'll go back to our front view. And from here we can go ahead and zoom in a little bit. And let's go ahead and add faces to the center of this object. Let's go up to our mode so we can go to Add Faces. From here we simply click and we add faces in a triangular pattern. This is how Imagine adds its faces. So remember, the triangles are the, are the faces themselves. As you can see, when we skin the object, it too did a triangular pattern with the faces as it added it to the object for us. Let's go back to our perspective view and check this and see we have a face on this. As you can see, we do. We created one face. We still have one more face to create. We can go back and do that. Let's do it the exact same way. Click on your left mouse button, pick in each point. Go back to perspective in the shaded mode, and you can check to make sure your faces have been added. Our picture frame is looking a little bit more like a real frame. However, as you can see, the front side of our picture is still very flat we need to move the inside lines back toward the back. What we want to do next is go ahead and pick the object, and let's extrude this object. The way we want to do that is to use the extruder tool, which is in the uh, mode requester. If you'll use right Omega E, you will bring up this requester. Click on Extrude, and as you can see, we can extrude the length. We can set this length. 100 would be a little bit long for a picture frame. Let's use 20 instead. One section would be more than enough, but we'll go ahead and use this. Let's go ahead and click Perform. We now have extruded this object. You can see so in the 3D perspective view that our object now has sides all the way around it. The next thing we want to do is go into Pick Points. This would be in a mode. Pick Points. You can see that our points are now visible to us. We want to make sure that our pick method is drag box. We want to go to our right view. Drag box will, will if you were to select these points in the front view, drag box would select the points not only in this particular screen, but also the back points. We do not want to move the back points. We just want to move the front points. 
So we could, collect, we could select these points in the top view or the right view, but we would not want to select these in the front view. If we were to hold down your shift key, go into multi-pick mode, click your left mouse button, and drag around the inside points and select them. You'll see they will turn red. We can use the move feature now by simply using M on the keyboard, moving the local axis. We will also use Shift Y. We want to move these points in the Y direction toward the back of our picture frame. Space bar. And as we can see, we have moved our points away from the front, and we no longer have a flat surface. We want to go back into pit groups, because the next thing we want to do is we want to put a picture inside our frame. In order to do that, we will need to also go into our attributes requester. This is F7. Under the attributes requester, you'll see we have an object name for our object. It is Axis 1. Imagine we'll always name your objects when it brings up the requester. Let's use instead, let's change this name to Frame. The reason we want to do this is when we load our object into the stage editor and then go to look at this object in the action editor, we will find that Axis 1 will be the name that the action editor will use. It gets the name from the attributes requester under object name from right here. So what we want to do is make sure that every time we save an object, make sure that we have changed the name of the object in the attributes requester so the action editor will reflect it. Now the attributes requester can do a number of things for us. We can change the color of our object. We have a choice of any 16.7 million colors to choose from. The way to do this is to click on the color, and X will mark the box. You can either type in numerically from the keyboard the number that you want to set your color at, or what I normally do is go ahead and drag the slide bars. As you can see, your color is updated in the box to the right. We will give this object a little bit of a brown color. We can also go down to reflect. And reflectivity will decide how much of the surrounding environment our object will reflect, such as a mirror. The higher the value, the more the objects around this particular object, or say a global brush, will reflect into this object. The lower the value means that there will be very little reflectivity. Filter is simply another word for transparency. And if you'll think of it this way, it's much easier to set because the lower the setting, there, are, there is no transparency. Your object is completely opaque. If you raise these settings, you will raise the transparency of your object all the way to where it is nearly invisible. Specular is simply a way to determine how the light will will react to your object. If you had a shiny object that was very hard, the specular light on this object would be probably a tight round circle. If you made your specular a white light, then you would see a white dot onto your object. The best object to see specular on are things like balls or spheres. Flat objects tend to show very little specular, especially in steels. However, when they're moving through space, when they're animated, you will be able to see the specular as they move across the light. Dittering is a feature that you want to use if you're rendering your images in ham. They will, this will decide how smooth your colors are, especially your blending uh, from one color change to the other. And 20, if you're rendering 24-bit images, you do not need to be concerned with the dittering. Hardness will simply decide how hard an object is, whether it's as soft as rubber or as hard as granite. You can do this by raising the slider. This will make the object hard. 
in the middle would be somewhere similar to wood. So we will go ahead and leave our slider in the middle for this particular object since it is more or less a wood frame. Roughness, this attribute will actually decide if your surface of your object is either smooth, completely smooth, or does it have a little bit of a rough texture to it. One thing to remember, roughness can only be used in steels. You do not want to animate with roughness. It will move on your object. So do not use roughness when you're animating. Shininess is used to create shine on your object similar to metals. This will create a more diffuse type shine. It will not be a perfect reflection such as you would see in a mirror. So if you are creating metal text to animate or to use in steels, then you might want to use shininess. Index of refraction determines how light is bent. One of the features that you would use index of refraction with would be glass objects. Fog length is another attribute that will determine the length, the density of the fog because an object can now be a fog object. And you will see that when we go into our attributes under our presets, that a fog attribute preset will be located there. From here you can change any object you want and make it a dense fog object or a light fog object. It's great for creating light beams or even just a, a regular uh, foggy object that will look more like a piece of smoke in the air, hanging in the air. You can change the color of the fog to blue, it can be green, or any other color you choose. Fog shading is an interesting shader. It can do many things to your object. The main thing that fine shader will do will be to round the corners of the sharp edges of your object. If you do not want to render an object with, let's say, has uh, 100, 200 edges, and you, all these edges right now are sharp, and you want to round these corners off a little bit, you could just use your fine shading, and it will do that for you automatically. Fast draw is simply a way to update your image of your object much quicker on your screen. It uh, really should be called Quick Trial because Quick Trial is used throughout the other editors, such as your stage. Bright will make an object appear bright in darkness, such as windows on a building at night. You can have an object be a light. Under this menu, you can click on it, and you'll see you have different kinds of lights that the object can emit. It can emit a spherical light, such as our sun. Cylindrical and conical are used primarily for spotlights. We can cast shadows, or we can diminish the intensity. We can also change the color of the light that it emits. Also in the attributes we question, we can load in preset attributes. To do so, just click on the load, go to your attributes directory, and you will see the preset attributes that come with Imagine. Imagine now comes with different types of Chrome attributes. You have your fog attribute, as well as several different types of glass. This saves you a lot of time. If you're going to render a Chrome object, you can go right to your preset attributes, make the object Chrome, and you're done. Another thing you can do is you can save the attributes that you set up for your particular object. If you had an attribute that was very close to wood and you wanted to save this, simply type in your attributes and when you're finished, click on save. A directory will pop come up and you can simply type in the name of your attribute and then just hit OK to save it. Then whenever you wanted to use your attribute on any other object at any time, you can simply bring it up without having to redo it over and over and over. Also add textures to your objects within Imagine as well as IFF pictures. By clicking on the texture, Imagine comes with some textures that you can put right onto your object. You have an angular, you add bricks, camo is a camouflage texture. You have checks and checks too. Disturb, you can put dots or a grid. You can also have linear. Pastel radial, you can add spots, do waves, 
which is good for creating sandy beaches or desert scenes. You can also have a wood texture. Under brush maps, we'll simply load in any preset drawing that you have already made and store it away in one of your drawers. Imagine has a drawer that I put most of my pictures in, which isn't called a picture drawer, where I gather most of my pictures from. However, for this tutorial, I've created a picture in D-Paint. This picture is of a picture that came with D-Paint itself. We will select it. If we selected the picture, you're presented with a way to put the picture onto the object. Now, we're dealing with a flat surface, so we would want to use the method we would want to use would be flat X and flat Z. If we had a sphere, we might want to wrap the image around the object using a wrap Z, which will take the image and wrap it from left to right. The type of image that we have for this particular type of uh, tutorial will be our color image. This is just the exact represent representation of the image you have selected. You could have an image that uses reflective values or a filtering effect which would take any image that perhaps has black in the image and through the black you would see the color of the object shine through this image. Altitude will take a brush map and apply it to an object and actually take the lighter colors and make these colors stand up a little bit higher off of the object while the darker colors would be a little bit lower. You can also apply to children objects brush maps what this means is if you had an object that you had several other objects that you were grouping, the first object that you create, of course, is your parent object. The other objects that you have grouped this object to are your children objects. You can apply your brush match to those objects as well as your parent object by using this feature here. Under repeat, you can have your brush match repeat such as uh, in similar to a tile or a bathroom wall where you could actually space the uh, pictures out and have them tile up and down and across, creating on one plane without having to create 50 or 30 different objects to accomplish the same thing. Let's go ahead and edit our axis on our picture frame. As you see, our, the brush map is already laid across our object as a default, which is correct. However, in our situation, the picture is covering the entire frame and we just want to do the inside part of the frame with our picture. What you would do is you would go into scale and we will scale this down a little bit smaller. We then need to move our brush map up to the inside. You'll see right here, this square right here is our, is our brush map. This is where it will appear. The outside part of this is meaningless. Do not be concerned with that. We need to scale our image down just a little bit more. And we now have a brush map exactly in the center of our object. One other thing I want to show you is by going to right view for just a moment, we will zoom in. As you can see, our, the dotted line is actually the picture itself while the solid line is the edge or the front part of the object. The dotted line needs to be to the front of the object itself in order to be seen. If I were to move this dotted line to the back side of the object's edge, you would no longer see the picture when we, when we laid it down. So sometimes when you're moving your images around, trying to adjust them, make sure that if you do not see your image when you render your object, check and make sure that it is in front of the face itself. When you're finished placing the brush, go ahead and hit your space bar, and your brush is now put on your object. Let's go ahead and render this object just to check everything and make sure our brush map is in the proper place.
We do so by going to our drop menu where you will see the Quick Render. Quick Render is a new feature to 2.0. It is in the Detail Editor, Forms Editor, and also the Stage Editor. This prevents you from having to leave the editor to go back to your project menu in order to render all your images to see what you're doing. It's a good way to check everything that you're doing before you have to go into your stage. It also has a default light that it provides for you, which generally is the one I use, so I usually just click OK. If I wanted to do another lighting by changing the angles, I could do so by setting these numeric values. Our picture is located exactly in the center where we aligned it. However, the edges on our picture frame are not showing up very clearly. The fine shading has smoothed those out, so we'll need to make those sharp. The way to make corners sharp will be to go into the pick edges, And what we will need to do is to pick the edges of the picture frame by going ahead and using the pick method with drag box. Hold down your shift key and select all points. Go to your functions menu, all the way down where you see make, and you'll see make sharp appear. Go back into pick groups. And let's re-render see what the differences are. As you can see, we were able to leave our phone shading on. And when we used the make shot, we brought out a lot of the details of the object itself. Now our picture frame is complete. One of the things that you'll be dealing with in the detail editor a lot will be picking points and manipulating points, whether it's one point or a group of points. We'll bring up a primitive sphere, set the defaults, and we'll select the sphere. We'll scale it a little bit larger. Now, if you go into pick points mode, which is omega-3, and you'll see as your mode will reflect pick points. We can do different things with the points. Remember when we were moving, rotating, and scaling the objects, we can do the same thing with the points themselves. We can hold in our shift key. We can drag a box around all the points. Now this will select the points throughout the entire object. They will turn red when they're selected. Now if we were to go into our scale mode, we could actually scale these points a little bit larger, or we could reduce them in size, and you can see you can create different shapes on your object. You can also rotate your points, forming twisting patterns. You can move your points such as, uh, let's start out with our x-axis. We can also move them on our y. And we can move them also on the z. So there are different things that we can do with not just one point, but with all the points. It didn't cancel in case you've made a mistake or revert you back to your original object. Clicking outside the object will deselect the points you have selected earlier. You can also, you can select any range of points and manipulate them the same way. If we want to scale the bottom, open up these points, instead of having a closed bottom, we can scale these points open.
and actually creates it entirely different. You can see a perspective mode. Now we appear to have made a round sphere, which could be a ball of any type, set it on a table, simply by just moving the bottom points. Sometimes when you're working with points, you'll notice that there will be too many points to actually go in and find just one in particular. A uh, feature you can do in pick points mode would be to hide some of the points. You would actually go into your mode menu and go down and while you're in pick points mode and select hide points. Whatever points you selected now will become hidden as you group them and they will disappear off your screen leaving just part of your object visible. You can go in and delete and hide, I should say, as many points as you need to. Now you can work on a particular area or a section of your object that needs more detail. Let's say we wanted to detail this part of the object a little bit more. We could also do this by what is called, if we wanted to round, say, this particular corner a little bit. What you can do with this is you can do a feature called Add Points, or you could also go in and use what I would like to do, which is called the Fracture Tool. Now, Fracture is a very interesting tool in that if you do not have enough points in your object, then you can go in and add the points to the object to cause some certain corners to be rounded while leaving the rest of the object alone. And this is very valuable, especially when you're on a low memory machine. If you were to go ahead and try to make your object perfect in all areas where you had flat areas, and then you had rounded areas, and then more flat areas, if you were to go ahead maybe and try to extrude this object or sweep this object with many sections in it to accomplish this, your object will take much longer to render, not to mention it's going to require much more memory. I've actually run out of memory just on the objects themselves by trying to make them too detailed. Uh, for the next exercise, let's go ahead and pick these points. Let's go ahead and delete this object. Bring up an axis by hitting F4, F1 to select it, and we're going to add lines which is Omega 9, and we will simply draw an outline around this axis. We will go back into Pick Groups mode, and we will use the Sweep feature by bringing up Omega E, and we will sweep this object. Now, we're going to sweep the object in a 360 degree manner. However, at this time, you could choose 45, 90, or just 180 and create just half the object. Of course, again, the number of sections will decide how detailed the object is. 24 will create a smooth object, while 48 will create an even smoother object. We'll go ahead and accept the defaults, and we've now swept the object. If we go to all three views, we'll see that we have an object that has been swept in 360 degrees. Now, like I was saying earlier, we wanted to take this object and actually smooth out, let's say, this portion of the object, make it just a little bit rounder than what it is. Let's hit undo, and we'll be back in our line mode. We can go in and zoom in a little bit on a particular area, and we'll go to pick points, Omega 3, and we can see we don't have but one point. This is why our object is, not, is, is flat and not is squared off and is not rounded. To round this object, we want to pick two points and add some points in here in order to round this up. So what you would do is you would go into Pick Edges. You will hold down the Shift key. And we'll pick two edges with our drag box, which is one of the edges. Now, if you go to Fracture, which is under your Functions menu, you'll see we've now added a new control point. Now, in order to make this very round, you want to make it very smooth, we'll fracture this same one again. Now we have 
two new control points. Again, we'll do the same thing with this particular area. We we'll want to fracture it also. We'll go back into pick method and click. And we will now go into drag points. Drag points is omega zero. And we will drag these points and, make, and round this corner off just a little bit more. As you see, we can never do that with just one point. But now we have more points to manipulate. We can be a little bit more detailed in this particular area. We'll zoom back out. We can see all the new, new points we've added. But we do not have to add points all the way through this object. We've only had to add them in a certain area. Let's go back into pit groups. We can sweep this object. Remember, it's Omega E for your mode requester. We'll go back to sweep and we'll accept the defaults that we did before and perform the same operation. Now, as you can see, we have a much smoother area where we added the points. And of course, this will show up in our perspective mode. We can really see the detail we've added along this particular area. You can do this on any object, anytime you see an area that needs to be smoothed out, and you know as well, I've only got one point, so I can't really do much with that particular area until I add a few more points. Just remember to just use your fracture tool and smooth out any rough edges you may have. Also remember that even if you do not have very many sections in an object, an object like this, which is rounded, can be further rounded by turning on the fine shading. When you're sweeping objects, the thing to remember is that whatever you're sweeping, the edge that you're drawing on will decide how the object will look. Sweeped objects are uh, very easy to do. You can create some very nice objects with a sweep command. You can sweep ca cans, uh, glasses, bottles. Any type of container that uh, is in a 360 degree circle is quite easy to do. Uh, we can create some different things with the sweep. We can create, uh, say, a little Coke bottle. Simply just add some lines in the shape of the Coke bottle. And then by using your sweep feature, you can then sweep this. We can scale this down a little bit. create a, a decent little Coke bottle. If we don't have the top end the way we want it, we can simply go in and pick points. Use your drag box. We'll scale these points down just a little bit. Until we have the look that we need. And we can create a fairly decent bottle very quickly. Remember, all you have to do with the sweep command is make sure that your outside line is identical to the object that you're wanting to sweep. And whenever you sweep it, you'll have an exact duplicate of your object very quickly. And this will save you very, very much time when you're working with your rounded type objects. I use this uh, feature quite a bit. You can also use the extrude feature to create uh, some different objects. Uh, one thing when you're extruding, you can do two things. You can extrude the object from the object itself. Or you can also extrude an object along a path. If you want to do that, the first thing you'll have to do, of course, is create a path. We will go into the functions menu under add. And we'll create an open path. Select the path. We'll scale it a little bit longer. We 
We can then edit the path. Go into your mold menu, where you'll see edit path. And then you'll see your control points that you can manipulate. Now, with these points selected, simply clicking with the left mouse button, for instance, we can rotate, move these individual points in any position that we need to. Let's go ahead and rotate this one point on the X. We can go ahead and look, pick the other point, and we'll do the same thing. And as you see, we have kind of an arch. Go back into pick groups, and we'll add a primitive plane to this. We use just one vertical section and one horizontal section on the plane. Ten would be uh, too many for this particular purpose. Most of the time, you'll use a simple plane. And what I mean by a simple plane, you'll have just one vertical and one horizontal section. We'll select the plane. We'll scale it down just a little bit. We'll then take the plane, move it to the left side of our path. And as you'll notice, the y-axis is pointing in the same direction if we'll redraw the screen pointing in the same direction as our path Y. What we can do now is go to our mode requester, and we can extrude this object along the path. We'll select the long path. We'll also need to align Y to the path. The number of sections that we want to use would be around 12. You can set as many as you need to. And we've now extruded a particular object along the path. And as you can see in our perspective view, we've created an arch. If we had made the path curve a little bit more, we could have made the arch curve a little bit more. We could also do a few more things with this. If we wanted to go in to big points, making sure we're in drag box, we can select the bottom points on the right side view. We'll zoom in just a little bit to get a little bit closer look. We will select just the bottom points, and we can move these points down. And as you see, we now have our little arch is completed. Modeling, modeling with Imagine is a little bit different than modeling in the real world. You're, you've got the same type of tools that a carpenter would have, but you have to learn to use them in a little bit different fashion. All you need to do is a lot of experimentation. Spend some time in the detail editor, move some objects around, move some points, try this, move some scaly object, move their points, uh, add points, whatever you have to do, but just keep working at it until you learn to use the modeler. Because everything that you do, you'll have to have an object to do it with. The stage editor is no good without objects, neither is the action, and neither is any kind of rendering you can do. You must have an object first. So the first phase of learning to imagine is to learn and understand the detail editor. Let's bring up our simple sphere. First, lead our path. We'll select the sphere. We'll go to our front view. You'll notice that we have many faces on the front of the sphere. We're actually all the way around the sphere. 
we can actually make any one of these faces a certain color. The way to do that is to go into Pick Faces, and let's select just a uh, just one face in the center here. And then we'll go into F7 in our Attributes Requester. From here, we can colorize, set the reflectivity, and also the transparency of individual faces on an object. If we wanted to change the color of this face, which is now white, we would change this color to a red. And when we render this object, we would have a red face with the rest of the object being white. Another way that you can manipulate objects is you can have objects conform to a sphere as well as when we extruded the flat plane along a path. You can also create tubing by extruding tube tubes along a path. You can create all kinds of hoses. Uh, electrical wiring would be a good example and create very realistic looking wires or a photo plugs, outlets on a stereo, and so forth. One of the things we want to do is conform a flat plane to a path, or actually to a sphere, excuse me. We will select the plane, and we will go to the mode requester, where we will conform to a sphere. The radius of the sphere determines how large your sphere is. The object radius is usually one to three times as large as your sphere radius. There's no exact coordinates that you can type in to create an exact scene that you're looking for with your object. You'll have to experiment a little bit with this. We will start out with the defaults and just see where this begins. As you see, when we zoom in a little bit, that we have conformed to the sphere. You can see approximately how large the sphere was. You can see from all sides that the flat plane did conform to the sphere. If we go into the perspective mode, we can see a little bit clearly how this object really looks. Let's go ahead and do this. Bring up our mode requester once, once again. Let's change our settings just a little bit. What if we had a sphere radius of only 25? And say an object radius of around 100. Let's see how this affects our object. You see it's bent a little bit more. The smaller the sphere, the more it tends to want to wrap around the sphere. So we can continue to play with these settings until we get the exact look that we're needing. Another tool that we can use that is found in the mode requester is called the replicate. We brought a primitive. We'll use a plane for this one. And we'll go to the mode requester and we'll go to replicate. Replicate can make copies of your object in a certain translation of the Z and X axis. If we wanted to replicate our plane, we could do so in the length of 100. We could make as many as five copies. We could change it to 10, and we will probably do, do just that. And we want to trans, if we just, just did it without saying the Z and the X translate, as you see, our object would simply replicate all the way back along the Y until we had 10 different copies of the object. We could also replicate this particular object 
and use the Z translate and offset this by about five. As you see, it has changed from going straight outward to kind of want to go down to a, toward an incline going upwards. So we can actually manipulate the direction that the object is replicating in as well as we can actually change the height and also the x value of the object at the same time. Another tool that's very useful in Imagine is a slice tool. Let's bring up a cone. Let's make a copy of the cone. We can actually use the slice tool to cut into objects. We can do this by bringing up other primitive objects or other objects that we may have created and actually push these objects into one another and actually slice away parts of the object, slice objects in two. You can also use the slice feature to add faces to an object. To give you an example of how to add faces, let's say that we had a map of one of the states that we wanted to add faces to. We first created the outline using the add line mode. Well, as you know, when you're using add lines, you, you got to go back in somehow and add faces. And if you were making a very detailed representation of the state, you would probably have two or three hundred points. It would take you quite some time to manually lay down each face on a particular object like that. All you would need to do is take the state, extrude it, then bring up your your plane tool, plane primitive, put your plane inside this object and simply hit slice. It will slice the object in two, leaving two objects, and one of them already had the faces added to it automatically for you. It will save you much time. Let me just give you an example of how a slice can do this. We'll take one cone, and we're going to put one cone inside another cone. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pretend that this cone is more of a drill bit or an electric drill. We will go ahead and try to cut a hole inside this other cone. Now, way, way to do that, you'll need to select both and then select slice from your object menu. Now, you'll notice that the slice tool has broken up your other object into little pieces. So you have a mess to clean up, just like you would in real life. So let's clean up our mess. We'll first select all the objects, and then we'll ungroup the objects, and then we'll start selecting them and, and deleting the objects that we don't want. As you can see, we do have a hole inside our object that we just made. We'll go into our perspective mode. We'll turn the object around. And we'll see we do have a hole inside our object, just as though someone had taken a drill and drilled it out. Another example of using the plane to add faces. Let's show that now. We'll delete this object. We'll bring up a sphere. And we can do some things with the sphere. We can delete points as well. If you go to pick points mode, go back into your drag box. We can pick half of these points. If we haven't selected, we can go ahead and delete these. We'll pick the object. And as you can see, we have lost half of the object. 
Well, let's say that from this part of the object on back, we want to add some faces to this object now. Well, as you see, we do not have anything at all. It's a hollow object. And we want to add some faces down the front of this object. What you can do now is bring up a primitive plane. We'll select the plane and scale it up a little bit larger. Make sure it covers the entire object. Then we'll move this plane back. And we'll cover this part of the object right here. So as you can see, we are now inside the object. The object does not have a front on it. And we are going to try to cut this object and apply faces to it. We'll select both. Then we'll use the slice feature. When slice is finished, we'll go back in and pick, up, pick all objects. Ungroup. And then we'll start cleaning things up. As you can see, imagine it's added our face to our object. It was in group mode. So we now have two separate objects here. We can go back in and click on both. We can regroup these and have one object, or we could go ahead and join these objects. The difference is, when you're grouping objects, you have a choice of ungrouping them later on. When you're going into the join feature, Join is more of a permanent feature. However, there are ways to slice apart your object and to separate them again with their separate axes. Because when you join, you may have four objects out there, each with their own separate axes. When you use the join, you'll end up with just one axis. Let's go ahead and join our two pieces of we have here on the object. We'll go to the right view. And we'll zoom in a little bit. You can use your arrow keys to move around your screen. If you move your right arrow key, you'll move your screen to the right. Left, move your screen left. Up, and move it up. And down, move it down. So we can actually manipulate what we're looking at with this object. We can see that we uh, can go in quite close to the object to make sure that our edge is exactly where we want it to be from our first object that we cut. Then we can move the object and get it right next to the edge to make sure we have no gaps. We'll zoom back out. One cone, and we're going to put one cone inside another cone. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pretend that this cone is more of a drill bit or an electric drill. We will go ahead and try to cut a hole inside this other cone. Now, way, way to do that, you'll need to select both, and then select Slice from your object menu. Now, you'll notice that the Slice tool has broken up your other object into little pieces. So you have a mess to clean up, just like you would in real life. So let's clean up our mess. We'll first select all the objects, and then we'll ungroup the objects. And then we'll start selecting them and, and deleting the objects that we don't want. As you can see, we do have a hole 
inside our object that we just made. We'll go into our perspective mode. We'll turn the object around. And we'll see we do have a hole inside our object. Just as though someone had taken a drill and drilled it out. Another example of using the plane to add faces. Let's show that now. We'll delete this object. We'll bring up a sphere. And we can do some things with the sphere. We can delete points as well. If you go to pick points mode, go back into your drag box. We can pick half of these points. After we have them selected, we can go ahead and delete these. We'll pick the object. And as you can see, we have lost half of the object. Well, let's say that from this part of the object on back, we wanted to add some faces to this object now. Well, as you can see, we do not have anything at all. It's a hollow object. And we want to add some faces down the front of this object. What you can do now is bring up a primitive plane. We'll select the plane and scale it up a little bit larger. Make sure it covers the entire object. Then we'll move this plane back. And we'll cover this part of the object right here. So as you can see, we are now inside the object. The object does not have a front on it. And we are going to try to cut this object and apply faces to it. We'll select both. Then we'll use the slice feature. When slice is finished, we'll go back in and pick, up, pick all objects. Ungroup. And then we'll start cleaning things up. As you can see, imagine it's added our face to our object. It was in group mode. So we now have two separate objects here. We can go back in and click on both. We can regroup these and have one object, or we could go ahead and join these objects. The difference is, when you're grouping objects, you have the choice of ungrouping them later on. When you're going into the join feature, Join is more of a permanent feature. However, there are ways to slice apart your object and to separate them again with their separate axes. Because when you join, you may have four objects out there, each with their own separate axis. When you use a join, you'll end up with just one axis. Let's go ahead and join our two pieces of what we have here on the object. We'll go to the right view. And we'll zoom in a little bit. You can use your arrow keys to move around your screen. If you move your right arrow key, you'll move your screen to the right. Left to move your screen left, up and move it up, and down, move it down. So we can actually manipulate what we're looking at with this object. We can see that we uh, can go in quite close to the object to make sure that our edge is exactly where we want it to be from our first object that we cut. Then we can move the object and get it right next to the edge to make sure we have no gaps. zoom back out. And we can 
going to select both objects, and we'll use the join command. Under your functions menu, select join. Your object out now has one axis, it'll become one, one object. We'll use merge. Merge will actually clean up any redundant faces and merge the points together for you. Now when you go to perspective mode, you can see that we have put a front face on the front of this object very easily and very quickly by using the slice command. It would have taken us many minutes, uh, if not longer, to do this manually. Now we can also take objects such as a cone, and we can also join these objects together, and I will show you how to use the uh, slice command to separate objects. Now we have both cones selected. We'll join them. And we'll merge points. And we can bring up our plane. And we'll cut these objects with the plane. select both objects, then we'll go ahead and use slice. As you can see, we've taken two joined objects, and we have sliced them back into their separate objects once again. Each object now has their own axis. So, just remember that most of the time, when you're doing with the groups, it is not a permanent operation that you can ungroup at any time. When you're joining, it is more of a permanent operation. And there are some situations that you cannot slice or break apart joined objects. So be very careful. Make sure you know before you use one of these two commands that if you do join an object, you will not ever need a need to unjoin these objects again. Because sometimes it is permanent. Now we have three different objects on our screen right now. If we wanted to pick just one object, they're in a group. If we just pick groups, we'll pick all the objects. But say we just wanted to pick just the one cone. What you would do is go over to your pick select mode and use pick subgroup. If I select just this cone here, I have just that cone. If I want to select just the plane, I can select just the plane or the upright cone. So this way I can go in now and set attributes. Even though I've already grouped my objects, I can individually set attributes for any one of these objects any way I want to. When building objects by grouping objects together, this is called hierarchical modeling. When you're doing most of your modeling, you will want to go ahead and make, say, if you're making a copy of a VCR, you can, cop you can make just the outside box of the VCR. You can then add buttons. You can add doors switches or whatever, and just group them onto the object, or you can join them to the object. And this is what is meant by hierarchical uh, creation. Another thing we can do is we just go ahead and select all these objects here and delete them. Is Imagine has a, a new feature, which is under the Add menu under Functions. It is the font object. You can actually take out of your font directory, any system font that you have, and convert this into a 3D object. You select the font, the size of the font that you're wanting to use, and then you would type in the text that you want the font to be.
It will give you an option to add faces to the object. You want to check yes. And you see you now have your font. It has become an object. We'll go over front view. You know, imagine it's automatically turned your text into a 3D object. From here, if you wanted to, and you would probably need to, you would need to clean up some of the points. As you can see, the X is a little bit crooked. It doesn't come in perfect every time. As a matter of fact, that's one of the best looking ones I've done yet. Most times, it's not even this good. So it's not exactly the ideal way to create your 3D text, but it is a quick way in order to have a place to start from because it's much easier now to actually go in and just drag a few points, clean your fonts up, and then extrude them and render. Let's go ahead and pick this font. We'll zoom in a little bit. We'll go into drag points. And as we can see, we have some points way out of the line. You can take those and move those around a little bit. Straighten them up. and now our X is a little bit straighter. Our O is a little bit off, but do a little bit of work with it, not a whole lot. We'll just get it close for right now. We'll zoom back out. We can see we clean it up just a little bit. This will look a little bit better when we go to extrude it. And we will go ahead and do that. Bring up your mobile requester. Let's extrude this about to 25. We've now created a 3D text font. Very quickly and very easily. We can also add attributes to this font. Changing the color, we can load preset attributes. We could add brush maps onto this object. We could throw textures onto it. We could make this a fog object if we wanted to. So there's a lot of things you can do once you have the fonts in Imagine. And text is one of the one things you'll be using quite a bit of. Most of the work I found has been doing logos. And as we well know, logos requires a lot of font work. So you'll be spending a lot of time in a detailed editor, uh, picking points, manipulating points, and cleaning up some of the items that you convert. Another thing you can do, instead of going ahead and typing in text, is you could also have taken a program, one of your favorite paint programs, and you can take an IFF two-color image and convert that into a 3D font, or text, or I should say an object. The way to do that, paint your object a little bit larger than what you really need it to be. Make sure that your background will be black. Make sure the text is yellow or white. After you get through painting your object, you would simply go into your object menu where you will select Convert IFF, ILBM. It will bring up a requester to pick the picture that you have made and simply convert that picture into a 3D object for you. Very handy feature when you're looking for some, somewhere to save some time and to be able to draw a logo. Perhaps you can do that much easier in a paint program and you can try to do that within the Imagine Detailer itself. In our next example, I want to show you how to create an object, add faces to it, extrude the object, copy it, rotate the object, and then join together. This is important that you do this in a certain manner because Imagine will do different things with the object if it is not created and if these steps aren't followed correctly you will actually create an object that you did not want to do in the first place which is you're going to have lines going everywhere. 
But to avoid this, what you'll do is you'll bring up your axis, select your axis, and let's go ahead and go to Add Lines. And we'll start adding lines. And we'll try to match the lines that we just created at the top, making sure we have the same number of line points at the top as we do at the bottom. This will make adding faces to your object much easier. Once we have our lines, we will go ahead and add faces to them. Remember, you do this in a triangular pattern. So we'll start at the corner. And we'll start to add faces. Alternating up as we go along. We'll now check and make sure our faces are added correctly. As we can see, we do have faces all the way along this object. Now, after you've added your faces, the first thing you want to do is go into Pick Groups. And we want to go ahead right now, if we want this to be a 3D object, we want to go ahead and extrude it at this time. So you'll bring up your mode requester. Let's go to Extrude. We'll choose 25 we've now extruded. Another request we haven't touched on is the transformation requester. You bring it up by using right omega T. And it's from here we can, see so we can rotate objects, scale, translate, adjust alignment, size, and the position, or we could just do the axis only. What we want to do, we want to, we, we want to copy this object and then we'll paste it, select it, and bring up the transformation requester once again. And we actually want to uh, rotate this object on the z-axis 180 degrees. Redraw the screen. You see we now have two objects. Now we can now join these objects together if we wanted to. The thing I wanted to point out here is any other way to do this than what we just did is incorrect. You will come up with a bug that Imagine has that if these steps aren't followed to the letter, will create different lines and will not join the points of these objects correctly. So make sure that when you're, the first step we did was we add our axes, create our lines or our edges of our object, create the faces first, then extrude the object, then copy, paste the object, and then rotate the object that you want to paste to. Now we can paste, join this object, we won't have any more problems or any unexpected happenings uh, as we would before. Let's go ahead and move our right object in line with our left. And we can now join these objects. We'll go to pick all, which is Omega A, and then we'll use our join. We have now joined the object. We'll merge points. And you see, nothing, nothing out of the unexpectedly happened. Everything went perfectly for us. Now with this object, you can now move. You can see you have just one object. Another way to manipulate points and objects is with the magnetism tool. In order to activate the magnetism, you will first want to be in drag points mode. You can go into your mode, select drag points. We can bring up a primitive. We'll use a sphere. We'll select the sphere. And we will go to magnetism. 
magnetism will affect a set of points or a group of points and manipulate the points in the same manner as you would model, be modeling clay. You can pull, stretch, and manipulate groups of points into more organic shapes. Before you start manipulating and moving the points, let's go to the magnetism setup. We're presented with the magnetism parameters. We see we have radius of influence, the minimum radius, and the percent of radius. The radius of influence will affect how much of the object will be affected when we start dragging the points with the magnetism tool, such as we may only want to move a small section, then we would use our small radius of influence at a low value. If we want to select more of the object to move around, then we want to raise the radius of influence to a higher value. The random radius option will affect a new radius of influence randomly each time you drag a different region. You can also set how powerful the magnetism effect will be by using the percent of radius. A low if you don't want to affect the points at the radius of influence, then you want to keep this value at zero. If you set the value to a high number, such as 80, 90, or 100, all the points in the region of influence will, will be moved the same amount, no matter what shape you specified. The magnetism type, you'll have three types. You'll have cone, dome, and the bell. The cone will actually create, when you pull on the object and drag the points, you'll see a shape of a cone being developed. It'll have a sharp point at the end. The dome will be more rounded. The bell will be similar to the cone, but a little bit more rounded at the top, similar to the dome. We will go ahead and use the default settings that we have and see what kind of effect this will have on our object. We'll click on Use. We'll go to get a little bit closer view. We'll go to Drag Points. And we'll see we're in drag points, and we see the magnetism is on. Let's go ahead and click one of the points to see how much of the region is going to be affected. And we see we have a very small region affected. The first thing we need to do is go back into our magnetism setup. Let's adjust our radius of influence to around 50. And let's use this setting. Now as we click on the point that we did previously, you'll see that we have more of the object is now being affected by the by using and turning up the radius of influence. As we move this object out, we see that it was going into more of the cone shape. If we wanted to use the dome, go back into setup, and now I select the dome. We should see a little bit rounded shape as we begin to move the object out. As you see, we do have a round, rounded edge now. We'll go ahead and move the other side. And we'll go ahead and manipulate this screen. Let's move our object a little bit more into view. We'll need to zoom out just a little bit. And let's go ahead and pull, push this side in. And we're going to go ahead and keep manipulating this object. You see me actually pushing in, just like molding with clay. So you just keep molding and bending until you have the object in the shape that you prefer. Now we can go to our perspective mode. And we can see what we have. So we have a, a more of an organic shaped object. We can continue to adjust our magnetism setup. We continue manipulating the object until we had exactly what we wanted it to be. 
which in this case, if we wanted to make a peanut from a sphere, we could go back into our magnetism setup. Let's change our percent of radius to let's lower the value to around 5. We'll get a little bit smoother. And we'll change our radius of influence to around 75 to affect more of the object. Go back and select a little bit less now. We can actually continue to manipulate and bend the object making it smoother and smoother as we go along. We can go back to our setup. We will use percent of radius. We will take this value up a little bit, see how it affects the object. We'll use 50. So you see we've been able to push and pull on the object to create the shape that we've needed to. And you can use magnetism to do several things, such as when you're extruding tubes, let's say on a uh, chair, you'll want to take part of the tubing that was bent, and you can use magnetism to push in where the bend is on the metal, creating a very realistic tube at the point where it is bent. This is just another tool that you can use within Imagine. And at this time, we have used most of the tools that Imagine has to offer. Some other things that we can do that we haven't used yet is our talk tool. When using the talk tool, you'll first want to go into pick points. At this time, we will go ahead and drag and pick some points where we have a curve. What TOT will do is straighten this curve out into a straight line for us automatically. It is in your functions menu, and you simply select TOT. Now you can see it has now created a straight, straight line instead of a curved line. You can use TOT to straight lines that were curved in your object anywhere, anytime that you need to by going to your pick points mode. You should be feeling pretty comfortable with some of the tools that we've been using so far in this tutorial tape. You pretty much have an idea of how to use the tools. The thing you have to do now is practice on your own. The more you play our last tutorial, we want to go in and set up some objects, such as chrome objects. We'll be creating a, gr a ground, a cloud background, and we'll be showing chrome reflectivity, uh, chrome spheres reflecting the environment. First thing we want to do is bring up our primitive plane. and bring it back. 
F7, bring up our attribute sequester. We want to name this ground. We'll change the color to a dark brown. And then we'll load a texture. The texture we want to use is one of the textures that I've purchased from the Essence Library, which has a bump map that we can put right onto our object and make it appear as though the ground is rough, not a very smooth surface. The settings have already been adjusted. So all we have to do is click on Edit Axis. We could always adjust the altitude, the number of scales, the initial scale that we have with this particular brush map. Like I said, the defaults will work just fine for this tutorial. We'll just use Edit Axis. The axis is placed exactly where it needs to be now with the textures. We'll just hit Spacebar and Accept and click OK. Now we're going to save this object as ground. Next time that we want to create, we will use the functions menu to add a perfect sphere. The reason so these will render a lot faster than this than your primitive sphere. Select the sphere, bring up your attributes. It is at this time we will load in a preset attribute, which will be the chrome attribute. Select OK. Then we'll save the sphere. So we better go back into F7. We'll change this to Chrome Sphere instead of just Sphere. If we have our spheres created, we will need a brush map or a picture of our clouds. If you do not have a picture of clouds, you can always paint one in the paint program. I already have a picture already made up from one of the libraries that I have. So we'll go ahead and just use it. So right now we have everything that we need to create our environment to reflect our chrome spheres from. We will go ahead and leave the detail editor. And we will go to the stage editor. As you can see, we've been in the detail editor. We have not opened a project. So we'll need to open a project first before we enter the stage. So we'll go to New. And we'll call this Project Test. We'll need to enter a new sub-project. And we'll enter Environment. This will bring up our parameters for rendering. We will to use the scan line method because we're going to be using global backdrop brushes to reflect our, our chrome spheres from, which will simulate ray trace mode, but we're going to increase rendering time considerably. It's also here that you can do black and white wireframe or shaded modes or color and color shade. We're going to want to go ahead and enter the DCTV as our frame buffer. We'll change our width on our picture to 704 by 480. And we'll use an X aspect of 6, which is what DCTV requires. If we didn't want to do this, we could have entered our presets. Well, you see, we could have rendered up the ham and overscan. You go lace, laced ham. We have low res, the 524-bit display buffer, and of course DCTV is already built in preset.
look around quick, okay. And this now in the stage editor. Go ahead and click on the camera to select it. And we're going to go ahead and bring up the transformation requester with Omega t right Omega T. And we're going to go ahead and place our camera in the center of our world. We'll use position zero for the X, Y, and Z. Do the same for your alignment. And then click perform. You'll see your camera is now exactly in the center of your screens and pointing exactly straight ahead. No more angles. We hit move L, shift Y to move the camera on its Y axis. We'll move it back a little bit. Space bar to accept the change. Let's go ahead and hit right Omega L. And let's load up our ground. F1 to select. We need to rotate a little bit on the Z, on the X axis. We'll move the ground back a little bit. We'll need to scale it some too. Next thing we want to do when we're in the stage editor is make sure that we're in the camera view. So that whatever the camera points at, this is what it will be looking at. We need to move our ground down just a little bit more. And a little bit more. And that's about right. And we want to go ahead and add our light. And we'll do it with the object menu and the light. If we want to select the light, we'll move this light. And we're going to put the light for right now just behind the camera. We'll save the scene. And right now we need to go to the action editor. It's here that we want to, we can adjust our light. We can also bring in our globals, which is what we want to do at this time. The way to do so is to take the little tick marks that you'll see, the card blocks. You'll be in information mode, and you'll want to take your left mouse button and click on the globals the timeline actor. This will bring up the requester for typing your globals. We can have a global brush name. You'll need to type in the path that your picture is located in, or we can use a backdrop picture. For the first part of this, we want to go ahead and load in a backdrop picture. In order to do so, we'll go ahead and click inside the backdrop picture, and we will go ahead and type in the path that our picture is located in. picture sky. When we have that in correctly, we can hit OK. We'll save changes, and then we'll go back to our project editor. The first thing we want to do is to render this image by having the background backdrop be a sky. And we'll have our ground down. What we'll do is render the image and save us as a 24-bit IFF image. We will then load this image into our global backdrop, and we will reflect the chrome spheres from this image that we generate. So we actually got to do a couple of things here before we can actually create the environment. When we do it this way, we create the exact environment that we're going to be reflecting our chrome spheres. So we'll go ahead and click on one, and we'll go ahead and hit generate. Do you see we have a requester pop up saying wrong size for backdrop picture? That means our backdrop picture is actually a different size than the size we're trying to render at this time. What you can do now is go into your modify after you've canceled, because we do not want to render this without the backdrop picture. We'll go ahead and modify our parameters, and we'll change this to the same size as the picture, to be 640 by 400. 
Now when we go ahead and hit generate, it will go ahead and load in the backdrop picture. Our image has finished rendering. We can go ahead and see this image by clicking on show. After our image is finished, we can see we have our sky backdrop picture and our bump mapping on our ground, which gives it irregular shapes, gives it more of a texture look to it. And now we have uh, our picture that we're going to be using as our global brush map. The next thing we want to do is go back into our action editor. And we'll go back to our globals. We will go ahead and type in our path for our global brush name. I've already saved this in the pictures directory on the same name, Sky. Making sure that after you type in the name, make sure that you hit return so that the brush name is accepted. If you do not type return, then go ahead and click OK. This field will not be updated. Now, after we have our global brush picture in, we still want to go ahead and use our backdrop picture. This way that when we put in our spheres, we will see this picture and the spheres reflecting the same picture. Of course, the, the spheres themselves will be reflecting our global, global brush. So we'll click OK. Let's go back into the stage editor and do one thing first. Save changes. Now, after we get back into our stage, since we're going to be using a, a uh, backdrop picture, we no longer need the ground. So we'll go ahead and delete the ground. And we can go ahead and add our spheres. We'll go ahead and position our spheres. And do a little scaling. We'll go ahead and add another one. and go ahead and position these a little bit more, get them a little bit further away from the camera. And we have our two spheres within our picture. Let's go ahead and save changes. Go back to the project editor. And now we can re-render these. Now, since we've already rendered one image, we have our generate new cells only. We have our box selected. Go ahead and unselect this. We want to go ahead and generate over the other image we just did. Now that our picture has finished generating, I wanted to show you something now that about Imagine in the, in the project editor. When we go into Info, we can see how long it took for our picture to render. If we'll click on Info, we'll see the rendering time on this picture was 2 minutes and 8 seconds. Now, I want to show you this because if we were to ray trace this image to receive the same amount of reflections that we have using the scan line, this image could have taken as long as hours to render. Now, the difference between scan line and ray tracing may not be so critical when you're rendering just one still. But if you can imagine two or three hundred frames to create an animation, you can see that ray trace mode could take you months just to create one animation. Whereas if we use the global reflection, we can always use scan line and create our animations in possibly just one day. Go ahead and look at our image now and see how it looks.
So you can see we have our global backdrop picture, which is shown up. We have our chrome spheres, and they're reflecting the environment around them. And the way this looks is it's like having the ground left in the stage editor and adding the clouds as a backdrop picture. But by adding the ground and saving it with our sky and running as one image, we were able to create the illusion of having the ground at the expense of not having to render the entire frame with a, with a floor in it. This sped up our rendering considerably. And our image still looks very real. Some of the animations that you might be doing will be involved in using brush maps to demonstrate documents as I have here. Sometimes I'll demonstrate some documents uh, where I work. And we'll have some documents opening up, showing what we'll have inside. And we can all, we also have a little tear out that uh, send out to clients if they can return. So we'll demonstrate that for them. This is the kind of animation that you'll, you'll be doing when doing a lot of logo work. And just to show you some of the power that Imagine has. <clears throat> One thing that I can suggest that you can do that can help you, uh, the machine I'm using is an accelerated computer. And if you want to help your rendering, the first thing I would invest in would be an accelerator board of some type. Right now you can get pretty good deals on 68,030, uh, 25, 33, or 40 megahertz would be the ideal accelerator to start out with. This can speed up your rendering times uh, by 10 times as fast as your stock 68,000 processor can do. Another thing that you can invest in will be a lot of 32-bit memory. This memory is, of course, twice as fast as your normal memory that comes with your 68,000 processor. Another advantage of getting an accelerator, besides being a little faster, is this will no longer be limited to the 8 megabytes of fast RAM that the 68,000 is limited to. The machine I've been using today is the Amiga 3000, and I'm running a 68,040 at 25 megahertz with 10 megabytes of memory. I hope you've enjoyed uh, our tutorial on working with a detail editor with Imagine. It is not a, an easy editor to work with at first, but as you become more familiar with some of the features that it has, and as you have a chance to experiment more, I'm hoping that this tape will give you an idea of how the tools work and a clear understanding of how each and every tool works so that when you are able to start on a project, you'll have a better idea of how you will begin and end your project. At the end of the video, if you have any questions uh, or suggestions, you can call us or you can write us. We'll leave our phone number as well as our address. And we, we welcome any comments that you may have. In the future, if this video is received well, we will have an opportunity to sit down and maybe think about doing a volume two and possibly looking into making a video about the animation part of Imagine. We really didn't have a chance to do that with this tape. Uh, the detail editor took a little bit more time, so if you want to have two hours available on a VHS tape, I thought about maybe doing volume two, just devote that many to animations. Of course, uh, in just a very short period of time, Imagine 3.0 will soon be released, which will have a whole new set of features, as well as some new editors. And uh, I'm look really looking forward to uh, getting the update to Imagine. I've been using Imagine now for over a year, and uh, I feel that I've only begun to scratch the surface of what this program can actually do. And I've worked with it extensively on a daily basis uh, for that period of time, 
and I still have a lot to learn. And I'm going to keep practicing and working at it, and hopefully I can get better and better so that my animations will improve. Uh, I think the one thing I can say is uh, a program like this is just very addictive. But good luck, and I hope you do well. I hope this video can help you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to give us a call. Thanks.